All right. Well, we will go ahead and get started. It's 3.01. Um, I have on my computer, so we'll go ahead and get started. I appreciate everyone for joining us and getting here on time. Thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and get started since we have a lot to talk about today. Uh, just again, to let everyone know, I am recording. Um, these will be available for future views um, probably Monday, um, putting on, on the website with the other ones. Um, if you need that, again, I can put it in the chat for you guys at the very end. Um, my name is Monica McCubrey. I am the Nebraska um, Outdoor Education Specialist for Wildlife uh, here in Nebraska at the Game and Parks Commission in Lincoln. Um, we're going to be going ahead and talking about invasive species today. So thanks for joining us on our uh, fourth, fourth uh, Science of series um, out of an eight-week series. So you have four more weeks of me afterwards if you keep continuing, which I hope you do, so thank you. Um, I will go ahead and let my co-host uh, share who she is today. Jamie, go ahead. Hi, I am Jamie Bachman. I am a wildlife educator. And you're on you. mute, Jamie. I don't know if we can hear you. Just a sec. Okay. She's saying hi, at least. <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. Keep going. All right, we'll just go ahead and go. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys. Um, just give me a second here and I will get it going. For some reason, I have to do it this way don't know why, but it doesn't like me sharing my screen this way. All right. So I think you guys see the presenter view here. So now I gotta redo this. Stop sharing and reshare this screen. All right, I think everyone's seeing the main page and not the presenter view. Jamie, right? Yes, okay, perfect. From some reason, I have it has a hard time doing this. So, all right, so we will go ahead and officially get started here, making sure that I'm recording. Yep, all right. Uh, so again, what we're gonna talk about today is gonna be invasive species. So uh, my name is Monica McCubrey. I'm the Wildlife Education Specialist for the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. Um, we're gonna talk about invasive species today. This is something that I really enjoy talking about and I think people, sometimes know about invasive species, but they don't really understand what it all entails or what an invasive species is or what's the difference between an invasive species and an exotic species. So we're going to talk about those today, specifically how they deal with uh, in Nebraska and the species that we have issues or problems with in Nebraska. So um, we won't be talking about any uh, Burmese pythons or anything like that today. If you are interested, certainly you can go ahead and look that up on your own. Um, and certainly not all the information that I tell you today is going to be all the information information that we have within the state. There's a lot that I did not cover um, and didn't put in this PowerPoint uh, just because we only have so much time. So, all right, we will go ahead and get going here. Really quick, what I wanted to do is talk about what an invasive species is. I know we've all heard this term, but we might not know exactly what it is. So according to the USDA, an uh, invasive species is a species that is non-native or what we sometimes call alien to the ecosystem. Um, the introduction of a species causes or is likely to cause harm to either human health, the economy, or the environment. So a key word within this whole phrase here is cause harm. So there's a lot of species that we consider non-native or alien to an area, um, but they don't necessarily cause harm to anything. They're just here. Um, an introduced species then to kind of uh, bounce off of that is a species that occurs outside of its native range whose spread has been facilitated by either humans directly or indirectly. So in a great example of an introduced species that is not invasive um, is the ringneck pheasant. So a lot of people don't know that these are actually non-native species. So they came over from China 
Uh, the specific species came over from China because um, people had a use for them. They wanted to hunt them or they're pretty or they're aesthetically pleasing to some people. Um, but uh, they're just what we call an introduced species. They're not invasive by any means. All right, so we also hear the word noxious a lot. Um, a lot of the times when we talk about noxious, we're talking about plants. Um, so the word noxious, according again to the USDA, is those that directly or indirectly cause problems for either agriculture, natural resources, wildlife, recreation, navigation, public health, or the environment. Um, so a lot of people sometimes call them nuisance plants as well. They can be invasive or introduced, um, but they also can be native and non-invasive. So uh, noxious kind of entails a lot of different things. So a lot of the times you might hear some noxious weeds that we have in our state or in our county. Um, there's a little bit different things. They are could be completely native. They're just more of a pest than anything. They also could be invasive. All right, and then we have one more exotic. Again, just not native to the continent on which it is found. Um, they can be invasive. They might not be invasive. They could be invasive in the future. Um, a lot of the plants that people have like in their house or sometimes people um, plant them in landscaping are gonna be those exotic plants. They're just simply not from this area, but that doesn't mean that they're causing harm. All right, another word that you guys might run into during this presentation is a pathway and vector. So a pathway just means that it's a route by which that invasive species are introduced to those environments. It can be either natural or man-made, either intentional or non-intentional, unintentional. Um, and then a vector is that biological pathway for a disease or a parasite. So when you think about invasive species, it's not just plants and animals, it's also diseases and viruses and funguses and fungi and all those different things. So um, um, think about that while we're uh, doing this program. All right, really quick, I also want to talk about why do species invade? Why do we have invasive species? Why are they a problem? Why do we have them in Nebraska? So a lot of the time it's because of the ecosystem and the sensitivity of that ecosystem. Um, some ecosystems are really vulnerable and some are not. Um, I know that Nebraska is not an island species by any means or an island area by any means, um, but places like Hawaii, um, Guam, a lot of those places kind of around the United States are perfect prime areas for invasive species to invade. Um, there could be biotic reasons, which are those living reasons, or those abiotic, which are the non-living reasons. Um, so for instance, there could be low species diversity. There could be um, a lot of enemies and pathogens. There could be already existing predators. Um, there's also more introductions than that island or that area can handle. Um, there could also be open niches. If there's niches that those animals aren't filling, invasive species come in and they fulfill those and they will thrive. There's suitable habitat. There could have been a disturbance in the land. There could have been a fire. There could have been an earthquake. There could be um, land use changes, simply something like draining a wetland and putting in an agricultural field. Anything like that can cause invasive species to thrive in those areas. All right, so invaders, why are they so good at being invasive species? Because some are clearly way better than others. Um, most invasive species are usually what we call generalists. They pretty much eat anything or they pretty much can live anywhere. They're very, very adaptable to certain things. They're also tolerant. They can tolerate heat, drought, climate change, disturbance, fire, any of those different things. Um, especially when we're talking about animals, not necessarily plants here, but animals, they have a low parental investment. They lay a lot of eggs, they do it quickly, they have a lot of babies, they do it in a short time, and they can produce a lot over a small period of time. When we're talking about plants, they usually have what we call novel weapons. Um, they have something that makes it easier for them to grow or they release a certain fungus in the soil so that other uh, plants can't grow around them or they grow really fast or they have really sharp things on them so that animals don't eat them and they can grow faster. Um, they also have a lot of different characteristics. They have genetic diversity. They can change in selection pressures. So, it's really easy for invasive species to invade because of they, these reasons. Um, a lot of the times they may be of human interest as well. They're pretty, um, they, people wanted them here. We'll get into a couple of different, especially the birds, we'll get into a couple of different things that when you see why these birds are considered invasive, you're just like, oh my gosh, really? This is why we have them? So um, it's kind of interesting to um, hear about all of these things, so. 
All right, so we're gonna go ahead and start. I'm gonna go through just the different categories. Um, a really great, uh, and I'll talk about this at the end too, but a really great reference that I use for this, uh, one of the many that I use for this presentation, but um, it's called NE Invasives. <clears throat> um, it's the UNL Invasive Species Program, and I'm pretty sure Allison Zock is on here. So hi, Allison, I will direct people to you. Um, also, if there's any questions, but um, so thanks for being on here if you're still here, so. We'll start with aquatic uh, today. There's quite a few of them. Uh, you guys might have heard of some of them. Again, some of them you might have never heard of before. Um, one of them that's very common as people hear about them are these things called zebra mussels. Um, the zebra mussels are the ones here on the left hand side, the ones that look like more like a zebra than the other ones. They're very small freshwater mussel, um, usually less than about an inch and a half long, so very, very small. And they get their name from their zebra-like kind of zigzag pattern that they have. Um, there's also something called, and I think this is how you pronounce it, a quagga mussel. Um, they're very pale. Um, they look similar to a zebra mussel, but they have more colored bars or bands and not necessarily that zigzag kind of chevron pattern. Uh, both of them can be found in those freshwater lakes and ponds and kind of those slow moving streams and rivers. Um, you might have seen a lot of information from either Game and Parks or the USDA or um, really, uh, the anybody that um, talks about how annoying and pesty these animals are um, or these mussels are. They can be found attached to really hard areas like cement, wood debris, vegetation rocks. Um, if boats are in the water a long time, they could be on the motor, just like this picture here. Um, these mussels, the quagga ones actually can bury into the sediment. Um, they think at one time what happened is that they were accidentally introduced um, via the ballast water on commercial ships vessels. Um, so they came to the United States and from then on they have just spread. Um, and what's interesting and um, good about these, not good about these, but um, what makes them easy for them to spread is that they can spread in different stages, either that larval stage or the adult stage. So they can attach to things like trailers, motors, other equipment, and they can survive up to about three weeks out of the water. So for instance, this boat uh, on the motor right here, um, they can survive three weeks without the water in the right conditions. So then the next time this person goes to put that boat in the water, they put it back in there and they're spreading again. So within the right conditions, they can last quite a ways without water. Uh, this is the most, I'm pretty sure the most updated map that I saw on that any invasives uh, website that I mentioned earlier. This is kind of where uh, they think they are or where they know for sure they are. So there are locations where they believe they are. There's locations that have potential and there's locations that yes, we have them here. Um, so what's so bad about these little mussels? Well, they get very dense colonies that they form. They eat a lot of plankton. They uh, take food from other species and they actually clean the water, which, wow, that sounds great, right? Well, not for certain species. They um, clean the water, but they also depleted a lot of the nutrients and a lot of that plankton, that phytoplankton that other animals need to eat. Also, if you like to go swimming, they can leave very sharp shells um, littered in the swimming areas. No one wants that when you're swimming. And if there's tons of them, people are not wanna, gonna want to go to these areas. Um, they also can clog the water intake pipes for treatment, power, and irrigation. So they are just more of a pest species than anything. That's why to prevent them, you should always wash your boats, your shoes, everything that's been in the water, wash it clean so that the next time you go to a certain area, you don't spread them. Very simple things that you can do. All right. Another one that we're going to talk about today, and if you notice on top, I have priority. This is the listing from the Any Invasives uh, Species website that these are priority. These are things that we know we have. We know pretty much where they are, and they're a priority that we need to take care of like now, like yesterday. Um, we've all heard of crayfish. So we do have native crayfish species in Nebraska, but we also have invasive crayfish species. One of those invasive species is called the red swamp crayfish. Looks super cute, um, but still an invasive species. They have found them below the Gavin's Point Dam, which is close to that Yankton, South Dakota area. They're again found in freshwater marshes, ponds, flowing, moving streams, rivers, lakes. Um, a lot of people will use them as bait for fishing. And then what happens is they eventually escape from that person and they uh, will spread that way. Um, a lot of schools actually use them in classes as well. This is a huge problem. We get a lot of questions about this. Um, that's why we are so um, adamant about not getting things like butterflies from a um, 
online resource and then raising them in your class and then letting them go. They are simply not from that area. Um, not saying that one butterfly is going to change the whole ecosystem, but when you get 30, 40, 50, thousand butterflies that are not from this area, you tend to start those problems then. A lot of people will actually use these two for uh, food. They're sold in live markets. Again, they can escape. Uh, so what's so bad about these little crayfish? They reduce uh, amphibians, aquatic plants, snails, insects, and fish. They also direct predate on all of these things, and they compete for habitat for native with native crayfish species and other animals. So they can also carry what's called the crayfish fungus plague. Um, not very common, but they can do that. All right, this one I'm sure a lot of people have heard as well, uh, silver carp. Uh, they're these big bodied fish. Um, they look very similar to what's called an Asian carp. Uh, they're freshwater fish that are found in the Missouri Loop, Elkhorn, Platte Rivers. We know for sure that they are there. They like uh, more turbid waters and they like more fast moving areas. They're native to Eastern Asia, Russia, Russia, China, and we probably think Vietnam as well. They were introduced on purpose in 1973 as a stockfish in Arkansas. There's been a lot of accidental escapes and what happens is they just make their way through the rivers and eventually they've ended up here in Nebraska. They are a very aggressive fish that eats a lot of plankton. They can eat a lot of their body weight and again they're out competing all those other animals for food, for habitats, for space, all of those things. Another thing, um, when people drive their boats through the water, um, that rumbling and the vibrations, it really, the fish don't like that. So they start jumping, which cool, fish jumping. Um, when they get to be 40, 60 pounds big, they jump out of the water, they hit you, um, and it caused a lot of injuries for people. Um, I do have a quick video. I want to just show you the beginning of this. Um, I think it's really interesting here. I'm going to try to do this. Can you guys see the video or is it just my screen still? Nope. Okay. So I will stop sharing. I'm going to reshare the screen. There we go. Kind of skip this uh, intro here. I do want to show you how they jump out of the water. This is what happens when a particular population of fish in the Illinois River is startled. Oh, right around that, that, behind the boat, wow. Watch out, they're everywhere. These are silver carp, the most notorious of the Asian carp family. Many believe the Illinois River has the densest population of silver carp in the nation. At ground zero, on this invasion. Asian carp were introduced to the United States in the 1970s to control algae and catfish farms in the South. In the 1980s, floodwaters allowed the carp to escape and infest the Mississippi River Basin. When it comes to the river systems, if it's connected, if it's got a direct connection to the Mississippi or the Illinois River, it's going to have these fish in it. Asian carp not only disrupt the food chain, push out native fish, are a nuisance to voters, but they are also extremely dangerous. This is about an average size silver carp. Uh, this is the one that can hurt you when it jumps. Your boat's going 20, 30 miles an hour and it's got to hit you. It's going to leave a mark. All right. All right. So again, I will let you guys go ahead and watch that on your own. Um, you can just Google search Silver Carp Illinois River and you'll get a lot of different kind of videos. Again, um, they're not as dense. I haven't seen them as dense here in Nebraska, um, but doing turtle surveys before, especially in the summer months when you, like the guy said, you're driving your boat 30 miles an hour down the river and all of a sudden the one hits you in the face. Um, you'll see here that video where I stopped it. Um, this couple, this group here was fishing, uh, bow fishing for those carp. Um, and what happened is that one of them came up and actually broke the girl's jaw. It came up and hit her um, and broke their jaw. So it's not something to take lightly. It sounds kind of funny getting hit by a fish, but um, it's, it's a serious problem. So again, they're, they're very large and they're very pesty and they're just getting um, more and more dense in certain areas. So, all right. 
Um, so some of them that I didn't go into, but they're what we call established in Nebraska. Um, there's things like the Asian clam, the big head carp, which is uh, pictured in this uh, on this PowerPoint right here. There's something called a Chinese mystery snail, chytrid fungus, we will get in that a little bit later, and that heterosporosis, which is a parasite. So, um, and then we also have something that's a potential threat. So we don't know a lot about it yet. It could be here, it might be here, we're not sure, but it is for sure a potential threat um, for Nebraska. Certain algaes, the largemouth bath, bass virus, uh, New Zealand mud snail, something called a snakehead, um, VHS, which is again, um, another virus, uh, the whirling disease. So it's not just animals and plants, it's diseases, it's viruses as well, and those pathogens that we'll talk about later. All right, are there any questions about those aquatic ones? Let's see, Jamie, was there anything that pressing? Um, I think that we got them all. Maybe okay. everybody know where they can view the webinar again, but I've kind of been running running that through on the chat. And okay. the silver carp are different than our common carp that is a native species. Yeah, yeah. Allison's been helping cover some of those more invasive questions that I could. Awesome. Thank you, Allison. I'm glad you were able to join today. Thank you. Awesome. All right, we'll go ahead and keep going then. We'll go into the wildlife category here. Um, one of them we'll talk about first is called the brown rat. Um, so to describe this animal, it is a brown rat. Um, they are long scaly tails, they're brown. Um, they can live a lot around humans, basements, the holes in the foundations. They can also live in fields and meadows. They're native to Asia. Um, they were introduced long time ago, back in the 1775 um, on trade ships. And now they are found on every single continent except Antarctica and every single US state except Hawaii and Alaska. Um, they're very destructive. Um, they carry diseases like the bubonic plague, typhus fever, rat bite fever. They're just not um, fun animals to have. And if you think about this, we talked about earlier about how invasive species are so good at repopulating. Think about this and do your math. I'm not a math person here, but each female can have four to 22 babies every single litter. And every single litter she has three to just three to 12 litters a year. So maximum, she has 12 litters a year times 22 babies, that's one rat. If you have thousands of rats, that number is going to add up very quickly. So they have that low reproductive rate. They don't have a ton of parental investment. They are mammals, so they do, but it's very quickly. They can sexually mature very quickly. So they're very good at invading areas. All right, Eurasian collared dove, um, very similar to a morning dove, but there's a great picture kind of comparing the two here. The Eurasian collared dove is going to be a little bit more hefty and a bigger bodied bird. Um, they're found statewide across Nebraska. Uh, they think what happened is that they were introduced uh, from the Bahamas. These certain birds escaped from a pet shop in the 70s, and the guy was like, well, the rest of them escaped. I'm just going to let the rest go. So we let about 50 of them go on purpose into the wild and it's kind of just exploded from there. Um, they chase off other birds. They're fairly large for birds that feed on feeders. So all the smaller songbirds get pushed out. Uh, these guys can also carry um, parasites that spread to native doves like our morning dove and then anything that would eat them afterwards. So if a hawk for some reason would grab onto these guys and eat them and that bird has that parasite, it could pass that on to the predatory bird that tried to eat them. So um, you see them quite often. Um, the Again, a big, big factor is when you see them, that characteristic is that collar around them, that collar dove. Our morning doves don't have that. All right, starlings. Uh, we see these guys everywhere. They're about the size of a robin, so fairly small. Um, they're found, again, everywhere. C cities, farms, ranches, open woodlands, fields, lots of different places. They were first found in Nebraska in 1930, so we know we've had them for a while. Uh, they were brought over from Europe um, and purposely released in New York City um, in 1890, 1891, because this person uh, that wanted to release them wanted to introduce the United States to all of Shakespeare's birds that he references in his plays. So that is the only reason that we have the starling here. Someone wanted um, us to revel in Shakespeare and all the birds that he mentioned. So um, a lot of people consider them pests because they eat a lot of the high protein uh, supplements that are given to livestock. So they damage corn as well. And basically uh, when you get a lot of these birds together, they will defecate and then underneath that, 
um, their nest, they can have the fungus that histoplasmosis, um, which is a respiratory disease. So when the wind blows it away, people could get it and it could cause, in very rare cases, it could cause blindness and even death. So um, they're a kind of a serious problem, but again, they are everywhere within Nebraska. All right, some other ones that I will mention, um, feral hogs. I, to my knowledge, we don't have a lot of these. Um, every once in a while, I think we will get some, but they are very pretty rare. Um, Missouri has quite a bit of them, but we just don't have them here in Nebraska. Um, house mouse, we do. House sparrows, those rock doves, and those feral pigeons, we do have quite a lot of. So again, a common thing that you will see with invasive species is that they um, outcompete their native people or their native uh, birds or their native insects, whatever they are, they outcompete those native species and they're very good at uh, tolerating and being flexible in their environment. All right, we'll go on to insects. Are there any pressing questions with birds or wildlife, I guess? Okay, cool. We'll go ahead and move on to insects. All right, this one I'm sure all of you guys have heard of. Um, this one is a priority. It's called the emerald ash borer, or sometimes people call them the EAB for short. Um, they're small little green insects with kind of a pretty bronze head on them, and they have pretty triangular looking um, larva um, under them. So the adults, what will happen is that they will lay eggs underneath the bark of ash trees. Doesn't matter what kind of ash trees, just ash trees. Um, and then they will eat the tissues of those trees as they grow. Once they become adults, they will bore a D-shaped hole out of the bark um, to get out. And so when people go to do um, surveys, they see these trees, they see those D-shaped holes. That is a clear sign that that um, insect has been in that tree. So there's been an infestation somewhere in this area with those um, emerald ash borers. It was first confirmed in Nebraska in 2016. It was in a park in Omaha. Uh, since then, they have been kind of spreading um, so far. They have been found in Lancaster County, for those of you that are here in, in Lincoln. Um, they were introduced from Asia, first found in Michigan in 2002. So they've been here quite a while um, and we're still finding them to this day. Uh, so what happens is they spread through the movement of the ash trees and the ash wood products um, and a lot of times they hitch ride on vehicles and infested areas. Um, so what can you do to prevent these? Um, if you've been camping or if you've seen some signs around Game and Parks, you will notice that there's a lot of um, when you buy firewood, burn it where you buy it. Um, people really, really highly say don't go buy firewood in Omaha and bring it all the way out to Calamus to burn it. Buy your firewood in the area that you're going to burn it because then you don't have to worry about possibly transmitting all those different um, insects to a certain area. And there are a lot of state and federal quarantines in places to prevent that spread. There are laws saying you can't take that firewood here and take it here and burn it there. All right. This one was a new one for me. I actually had not heard of this one before. Um, in our latest Trail Tales magazine, um, Allison actually wrote an article about the Asian jumping worm. Um, so very similar looking to an earthworm. Um, however, there are some subtle differences. They sometimes call these the snake worms or Alabama jumpers or crazy jumping worms because they just, they wriggle everywhere. Very, very different than an earthworm. Uh, so what do these guys do? Well, they deplete the soil of nutrients and they damage plant roots. So when they feed on the leaf litter in the soil, um, the stuff that comes out, those castings um, that worms uh, leave behind, it's very dry and grainy. Sometimes when people look at it, they think it looks like coffee ground. So if you see that, you know that those Asian jumping worms have been in that area. They have believed to have been introduced on accident to the U.S. Um, by a plant shipment. They got out and they have just spread since. Um, so how do you know if you see an earthworm or how do you know if you see an Asian jumping worm? So the picture does really good um, justice to these. Again, the biggest thing is these guys wiggle a lot. Um, very, very different than earthworms themselves. And then also what's called this little band called the clitellum. In the Asian jumping worm, it goes all the way around the animal, whereas in the um, earthworms, it does not. So there's a, um, a characteristic of them or a difference between them. Uh, so far, they have found them in Douglas, Lancaster, Sarpy, and Platte counties here in Nebraska. All right. 
these guys. I know a lot of people don't like them. Um, those Japanese beetles, uh, there's tons of them around. Um, I'm sure all of you guys have seen them. They eat my rose bushes every single year, no matter what I do, they just eat them. Um, but they're these really kind of pretty metallic green beetles that are from um, the Japan area and Asia. And um, these guys, they're similar looking to a June bug, kind of a little bit in the body shape of a June bug. Um, so the larva will feed in the lawns, um, the grubs, and then the adults will feed on things like rose bushes, grapes, crab apple, beans, um, but they can feed on over 300 different species. Again, they're not very, um, they're generalists. They don't have to have a specific plant to feed on. That's again what makes them such a great suspect for being an invasive species. Uh, they were first found in New Jersey in 1916. They spread through the nursery stock and then hitchhikers on vehicles or in the cargo. They cause lots of root damage, crop damage, and the defoliation of those host plants. So whatever they feed on, they just wear them down to basically the nubs. They eat everything. All right, some other ones that I will mention, um, the brown marmorated stink bug, they feed on crops and they leave uh, necrotic spots in the fruits and the leaves. And then something I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard of, mountain pine beetle, um, just like the EAB, that emerald ash borer, they bore holes in trees and leaves and they leave behind this kind of sawdusty material and they can actually cause the wood to be stained from a fungus. All right, any questions on insects? that need. Um, are those worms, Monica, ever used as bait? They certainly could be, I'm guessing, um, especially if people don't know that we have them or they don't know the difference between earthworms or um, the Asian jumping worms. And I believe I heard that they can sit or be in water for like half an hour, maybe up to 30 minutes. So unlike our earthworms. So I think that, um, I mean, if you found them, I guess people, yeah, they would use them for bait. Uh, it looks here, Allison just answered. A bunch of people asked, so uh, if you didn't, if you didn't catch that, everybody, you can check the chat. They're sold as Alabama wig wrigglers or other names similar to that, and some states have banned them to be used as bait. Thank you, Allison. All right, so we're gonna go to plants. Um, there's a lot of invasive plants. I will not talk about all of them today. I will kind of talk about some priority ones um, that Nebraska is really looking at and then some of the noxious plants as well. All right, one of them, um, a lot of people actually like this plant, whether it is invasive or not, but it is a priority, it's listed as a priority plant invasive here in Nebraska, it's called garlic mustard. So about four feet tall, um, when you crush it or you work it between your hands, it smells like garlic. Um, and what's fun is a lot of people will actually use it and um, uh, blend it into pesto. So um, you can eat it, it's totally fine. It, please pick it please go make a lot of pesto, um, get rid of it. But yeah, that garlic mustard is really, a lot of people use it to eat. Um, they have these long pod black seeds. Um, they can be found just about anywhere, shady roadsides, fields, forested areas. They're found in several counties in Nebraska and they're pretty widespread within those counties. They're originally from Europe. A lot of wildlife will actually use them um, for food because it tastes good and they'll use it and uh, butterflies will use that as nectar as well. However, they do outcompete again native vegetation and they can inhibit the growth of fungi. So all the little um, spores in the ground when they start making actual mushrooms and fungi, they can inhibit that growth. And, and we need those things because they um, break down all the leaf litter materials and dead things that we have um, in places like forests. All right, um, so a state noxious weed that we're going to talk about is called the Canada thistle. Um, again, kind of a pretty plant, but still what we call a state noxious weed. This one is invasive, um, about four feet high. They have these weird um, spiny looking foliages, as you'll notice in that picture, the pink or purple flowers. They're pretty widely spread across Nebraska, originally from Eurasia, North Africa. Uh, the seeds are very light and can spread by wind up to about half a mile, also by water water and wildlife. Um, these guys have caused about a multi-million dollar loss in crop production, um, so very invasive. Um, 
and then we call state noxious weed, again, um, can be invasive or not invasive, non-native or native. Um, and then what happens is these guys will release a toxic substance in the soil, which um, prohibits or inhibits the growth of other plants. So what happens is if they're here and they inhibit this thing in the soil, that makes all the other plants around them not grow. So they can take over that area. So again, um, novel weapons when we talk about invasive species. All right, I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard about this one too. It's considered a state noxious plant um, leafy spurge. This one is toxic to cattle. So um, the stems will have a very white milky substance that cattle find um, delicious to eat. Um, so if they eat them, they're very toxic. Um, they outcompete other plants. They have these really kind of pod bract looking um, yellow flowers on them. They're found in croplands, woodlands, shelter belts, rangelands, a lot of places where cattle are going to be. Um, again, originally from Eurasia, and these guys will spread their seeds a lot. So that is their pathway of introduction. All right, beautiful plant, right? That's why it was here. Uh, this is called a purple loosestrife. Um, so this plant was introduced on purpose from Europe as a landscaping plant because look at that picture. It's gorgeous. Um, people like them. They like the color. They like the flower, um, but it's kind of taken over. This is one of the plants that likes very um, wet areas. So places like marshes, river and creek beds, ditches, wet meadows. A lot of the times you will see them as you're driving on the interstate um, between July and September when they bloom. Uh, places like the Platte River, Niobrara River, um, you see a lot of these on the banks of the river. So um, they get very dense colonies and they prohibit the movement of water, they trap sediment, they change the water quality, and again they outcompete with that native vegetation. So very pretty plants but yet still an invasive species. All right, this one is more what we find in southeast Nebraska. So if you're not from this area, you might have never heard of this one. It's called Cerisia lespedisa. It's really fun to say. I don't know why, but it just kind of is. Um, they grow about five feet in height. They have these pea-like flowers that can be pink or purple, and they grow into a spike. Um, they're typically found in grasslands, roadsides, streams, but again, mostly in southeast Nebraska. Um, they were introduced on purpose from Asia as a bank stabilization and a forage for cattle. Um, they can found in grass seed mixtures too. So when people go to plant those grass seeds, it is in there as well and they just kind of take over. They can also be spread by wildlife itself. Um, one of the things that I found super interesting about this uh, species is that the seeds can remain viable for 20 years. A lot of seeds do not do that. Um, a lot of times if you, a couple months will kill the seeds. Um, these can be viable for 20 years. Um, they contain dyes that reduce the value of the forage and they will really aggressively outcompete native plants. I was just down in southeast Nebraska on Sunday um, changing some of my trail cam and this stuff is everywhere. There's signs posted at all of our uh, wildlife management areas kind of talking about what this species is and what does it look like and what does it do and you can just see it everywhere. The sign was almost overtaken by um, all the Cerisia lespedisa that was there. So, all right, any questions on plants? Otherwise I just have a couple more things about pathogens and then like what you can do um, to help with the invasive species problem. So any questions on plants? We're doing good. Okay, sweet, thanks Jamie. All right, so pathogens, again, it's not just plants and animals. Um, it is uh, diseases and viruses as well. So there's quite a few, but I'm going to go only through two main ones in Nebraska. Um, some of you might have heard of, you might not have heard of these. Uh, one that's pretty becoming more um, talked about and popular is called white nose syndrome. So this is something that is uh, hurting our bat species. So it is a disease that happens in hibernating or torpor bats when they go sleep for the winter um, and it's caused by this fungus geomyces destructans so what happens is you can see in this picture this white fuzzy fungus gets on these bats and it starts um 
kind of in their nose area, goes around their wings, um, on their um, arms and legs. It can be everywhere. They can just become covered in this. And it makes them, it erodes their skin and it has very abnormal behavior for these bats. It causes them to oftentimes wake up when they're sleeping or in the middle of the winter or when they're in that torpor stage um, and they fly outside in the winter time. So that might not sound like a big deal, um, but bats need all the fat reserves that they can possibly get. Um, if this happens a lot, they will deplete those fat reserves for the winter. And by the time that spring comes, they starve to death. They just cannot have enough energy. They don't have enough body weight to make it through that long winter if they have to keep waking up and doing this odd behavior. Um, so this thing was first confirmed in Nebraska in 2015 in Cass County. I believe it was an old abandoned mining um, area where they found um, lots of roosting bats together and they found this uh, fungus then. Um, first ever found in New York City. Um, in the United States, in New York City in 2007. They believe it came from Europe and over time it has spread through bat contact. So bats, a lot of the time, it really inhibits bats that roost together. So they're very close together, they rub up against each other, they touch each other, and that is how that fungus moves from bat to bat to bat to bat. Um, with the bat declines that we have seen within the United States, 80% of those bat declines has been from this white nose syndrome. So it's very serious issue. Um, we're not really sure what to do with it yet. We don't really know a ton about it. Researchers are doing all they can, um, but we're still needing to learn a lot more about this fungus. All right. And again, if you know me, I cannot do a presentation without either talking about reptiles or amphibians. So here's my a little reptile amphibian thing here. Um, there is one called chytrid fungus. Might have heard of this one, might not have heard of this one. Uh, chytrid is actually the short tin version of it. Um, but what happens is this affects our amphibian species. So You've probably heard that our amphibian species are in trouble. Um, they're declining, they're going extinct, we're not finding as many. One of the main reasons that is happening is this stuff called chytrid fungus. Um, the long version of it is chytridiomyosis, um, and it's caused by the fungal spore, I'm not going to say it because I don't know how, Bactridium dendro, that one. So um, if you read that, that is the fungal spore that's caused from. So what does this do? It infects the amphibian skin. So the skin is just layers and layers and layers of different stuff called keratin. That um, same stuff that your fingernails are made out of, your hair is made out of it, um, like a cow's horns, a rattlesnake tail is made out of it. It's just a specialized skin cell. So what happens is when these amphibians become infected with this disease, um, what will happen is that their skin layer becomes really rough. Um, and they can't absorb things. So when they sit in the water, they can't absorb oxygen, they can't absorb minerals, they can't absorb um, anything. So they basically die because they can't get the nutrients that they need. Um, how do you know if this amphibian has it? A lot of the times they are very lethargic. Um, if you find them, especially out in the wild, they don't want to move. You come up next to them and you can touch them. And they just are tired. They don't want to move. And a lot of the times they will have discolored skin. Um, this frog species here, you can see that their legs are super red. Um, that's not normal. Um, their skin also becomes, usually on their belly is where you see it. Um, scientists in Nebraska, um, people have been doing frog watch. They have been testing. Um, a lot of different places for chytrid, and it is here in Nebraska. They believe that it came from places like Africa, it could have come from North America. We're not exactly sure, but they think that it's been here a really long time. Um, but with increased temperature um, of our environment, they believe that it's starting to wake up again and be even more. So the last 20, 30, 40 years, our earth has been warming up and they believe that is what's making this fungus become even more alive and even more of a problem. So uh, one thing that I find totally fascinating is that bullfrogs, are immune to this. They just, they don't, they don't get it for some reason. Um, but things like our frogs, our toads, our salamanders can get it. Um, and you will definitely notice if an animal has this. So it's pretty obvious. All right, so should you report invasive species? Um, yes and no. So, and Allison, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on this one. Um, it depends on the species. There's a lot of them that we know they're here. Um, purple loosestrife is a good one. We know that it's here. It's a problem. We see lots of it. We don't need people to report it every single time. 
If you go to this website, the anyinvasives.com, um, it lists lots of different types of species and it goes through them just like I did today. It's wildlife, it's plants, it's pathogens, aquatics. Um, some of them, yes, we want you to report them. Um, if they are listed as either established or potential, or maybe we don't even know we have them, we want to know. Um, so there's a, a cool list on there of all the ones that I talked about today and ones that I didn't talk about today. And it says report a sighting. You can click, you can fill out some information and you reported your sighting. So very, very good stuff that we need to know. All right, so that is all that I have today. It was a little bit longer of one because we had a lot of cool information. Um, next week, October already, October 1st, um, from 3 to 4 p.m., same time on Thursday, we're going to talk about wildlife diseases. So some of the stuff might be a little similar that we talked about today, things like white nose syndrome or chytrid fungus. We're simply going to go into a little bit more depth about it. But we will also talk about things like chronic wasting disease and EHD that we had in deer. Don't know what EHD is? Well then join us next week and you can find out. All right, so the next four weeks we'll be talking about wildlife diseases and then fungi and then we actually have a bye week in there. October 15th we have nothing and then we will restart again on October 22nd, go back to October 29th. Um, our last one, we will have Grace Gard, who is the aquatic uh, wildlife education specialist, aquatic education specialist, join us. And we're going to talk about Nebraska fish, uh, not game fish, but fish that a lot of people don't know we have and just kind of some special cool characteristics that they have. And Daryl Bauer is actually going to join us on that one, too. So please, please catch them if you can. All right. So that's all I have. Remember to join us next week. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. All right, do you guys have any questions for me? Let's see. Monica, there was a lot of um, questions about where they can view the series again. Yeah, I will type it in the chat for you guys. Maybe, there it is. All right, so I'll go ahead and type it in the chat. If you guys uh, would like to see this again, or if you know someone that didn't uh, get a chance to watch it, or you can watch our previous ones, it's going to be on our Game and Parks online education page. So it's just outdoornebraska.gov slash online education. So, and then it's under the nature videos tab. So if you scroll down, you will see a lot of different things, citizen science, wild what's up. There's something called nature videos tab and then all of them are listed on there as well. And there's some other really cool education videos on there too. So someone asked what's in the cage behind me. This is Chomper. He's our little snapping turtle here. He's about five years old. He's hungry. Um, our staff assistant, I can hear feeding him. So he's probably is knowing that it's time to eat. So, all right. Any other questions or anything else? Hopefully you guys learned some stuff today. I think invasive species are actually really neat. I know they're, they're not good for our environment, but it kind of fascinates me about how they're here and why they're here and why they thrive in certain areas and why they don't. So um, my dream job one time, um, mom, you're on this. I don't know if you know this or not. My dream job one time was to be in um, Florida and work in the, somewhere in Florida in the Everglades area and work with those invasive Burmese pythons. That was like my dream job. So, but now I'm here teaching about them. So I'll take it instead. So, all right. And thank you again, my co-host, Jamie. Thank you very much for monitoring the chat. And Allison Zach, thank you so much for answering those questions. Um, she is the coordinator of the Invasive Species Program for UNL. We work really closely with her. She's awesome. If you guys have any questions, um, certainly she would be able to answer them. She also has some really cool education materials. So if you go to that NE Invasives, invasives.com, um, whoops, not to just her, Sorry guys, <laughs> it's been a long day. There we go, anyinvasives.com. There's education materials on there. She has some backpacks. I'm not sure if she's checking them out because of COVID, but she has quite a few educational materials. There's a lot of cool information on there if you're interested in invasive species. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, I'll hang around for another minute or so, but otherwise, please feel free to join us next week as we talk about wildlife diseases. So thank you. All right. Any other questions? If you have questions, please feel free to type them in the chat. I will not unmute anybody today, um, but if you have questions, you can either email me or type them in the chat. Thanks, guys.
Thanks, Jamie. Yes, absolutely. We'll record this. I know I talk really fast. I'm so sorry. It always happens. <laughs> I'm glad that I can record them, though. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm going to head out here, but um, thanks for joining us, and hopefully we see you next week.